Dear everyone, colleague, uh, good evening, good morning, good afternoon. Assalamu alaikum, wherever you are, whenever you are, we are very sorry for the late 10 minutes delay because of technical problem. Uh, my apology for this. Today we'll talk about the sixth episode of Fadfada, which is problem facing charitable and social organizations which have started this episodes about nearly two months ago. Today we'll discuss another five issues, uh, which uh, I'll mention them later on. And let us thank, first of all, our young uh, colleague, Aya, for doing the uh, media production. And let us go to discuss the five issues. Uh, I thank everybody. I think I mentioned those, the, this name of, the, of, of my colleagues many times in my previous episodes, but today I will just focus on one of the younger volunteers. His name is Mustafa Maad, and he is from Idlib, and he is studying uh, pharmacy, who gave me uh, uh, the core message of this uh, session today, or this episode today. The five uh, issues are, number one, the lack or absence of honest and frank competition between organizations, humanitarian and social organization. Number two, the traditional haphazardly spontaneous response of some of, 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 of this organization due to a lack of professionalism. And number three, the status of intellectual stagnation. And the, the status quo is the same. Number four, the weak organization structure. Uh, in some organizations, uh, some people are in control of this organization. And the weak synchronization between the structure, between the weak structure and the value, the message, and the strategy of the organization. Number five, which is a widespread culture of what we call it materialistic charitable work among the organization, which only counting or based its activity on fundraising direction. Let us go to the first point, which is the lack or absence of honest and frank competition between organizations. Competition is something which is very normal, extremely normal between any organization, whether it's called commercial, industrial, uh, political, uh, media, uh, newspapers, uh, educational, research, military, security, it's there. It's there. There's competition. And sometimes such competition becomes uh, honest, and sometimes it is not honest. It is dishonest. And uh, there's no job or business, no matter what, without having local, national, regional, or international competition. And this is a very old community culture and tradition. Such a competition could create, listen to this, because I will repeat this one in the discussion later on. Pentagonal hierarchical structure made out of transparency, become transparent, based on transparency, transparency, legal, legitimate, honest, and benefiting. And if you want to build this pentagonal, Hierarchical structure, they should have these five points to be transparent, the competition to be transparent, legal, legitimate, honest, and benefiting societies. Okay? As I mentioned earlier on, many organizations can go and drift outside the honest competition. Okay? As like, like commercial or trade or industry or manufacturing or military or security or research and, 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 and. And this is something which is we experience it. Sometimes they're lawful, sometimes not lawful, sometimes honest, sometimes dishonest. Okay. But what is happening nowadays is to find this dishonest competition happening amongst what we call humanitarian, charitable, and social organization. Why I'm saying it is very strange not acceptable because such organization has certain slogans, certain slogans based on morality, sometimes religious, 
sometimes noble, sometimes value-based, and, and, and. Many, many noble slogans. And some of, such, some of these slogans are, we are activating communities. We are empowering citizens. We are enriching the poor and the needy. We are guiding the reclusive worshippers. We are framing the anti-corruption policies to protect the poor people's right. We are protecting the natural and financial resources of the most marginalized community members and drawing the highest, no, no, not the highest, sorry, drawing the brightest future for generations to come. These are some of the slogans, the social and humanitarian voluntary organizations are raising. That's why it's not acceptable to see them, unfortunately, to see them, unfortunately, to see them, unfortunately, uh, uh, having this dishonest uh, competition. Do you know why this could happen? This dishonest or this is, yeah, uh, uh, competition. Number one, number one, the power of money and the power of authority. In some of these social or humanitarian organization, the money becomes millions or hundreds of millions or tens of millions and it's giving you a powerful status, give you authority and let you to think that you can do what nobody else can do, arrogancy. But I am reminding those people in power in such organization that, that you have to realize that the money you have is public money and the ownership of such money is private ownership. What do I mean by that? Public money should be is regulated according to the transparency and the accountability criteria of governments. See through. Okay. Having private ownership, it means the real owner of such organization and such fund are the poor and the needy. And I'm delivering this message every now and then in all my talks to you to put pressure and to keep putting the responsibility on the shoulders of whom? Of the humanitarian and social worker working in such, such organization, telling them, be careful. This money is not a private money. It's not a business. It's not, 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 not. It is the poor people's money. You have to be very careful when you spend it. And through spending it, you have to protect the dignity of the owner of this organization. We always have to remind ourselves that we are, me and you, all of you, all of us, are the servants. And the poor people are the servants. We are the servants and they are the masters. We are the worker and they are the employers. We are the employee and they are the employers. This is number one, okay, which might lead to this dishonest organization. Second one is very difficult. It's very difficult for us to have such a dishonest competition. And we, as I mentioned earlier, our message, our value, our morality, our mission, our vision, our objectives are noble. Cannot accept this. The backbiting, the backstabbing, cutting the throat of your colleague or the organization to get the fund before them, blocking the way in front of them, uh, backbiting them and all this stuff. Cannot acceptable, can be acceptable. No. Third one, okay, how the poor people looked at us. You know how they realize how. The, our image at the back of their mind, they consider us the saviors, the saviors. So such saviors like us should not be having this dishonest competition with their colleagues. Who are the saviors, which will take them out of poverty, hardship, humiliation, self-weakness, considering them being broken hearted will take them out of this situation unveiling their vulnerability to cover their vulnerability who are the savior from being ashamed by people 
for being disrespected by the close and the faraway people, from people not having an opinion in any discussion. We are the savior to protect them. When those people look at us and they are the real owner of the organization, we should not, we should never, we should not, we should never have this dishonest competition between us and our colleague organ, uh, organ, organization. Number four, they consider us what? The poor people, the owners or the, the employers as reformers or messengers of the messenger of God. If we don't observe what we say and what we write in our message, in our mission statement, in our message, in our objective, in our strategy, in our aim and objectives, we will be considered as or be put in the ranks if we don't observe or follow all these declared the principles we will put ourselves in these ranks ranks of hypocritical of hypocrites who say what they don't do those spend thrifts who are uh, who, or the ranks of the spent thrifts who are brothers to the devils, the ranks of those who eat orphans and widows' money because we don't do what we say, the ranks of those who hoard for themselves the gold and silver, the ranks of those who are dividing sites and dispersing families, the ranks of those who are backbiters. Landers, gossipers, and and eating the flesh of their the dead body of their brothers and sisters, ranks of those who walk amongst people spreading perjury, uh, falsehood, lies, and fading. So we have to stand up to what we say. Otherwise, if we don't do that, actually we'll be put in these ranks. And lastly, we'll become the firewood of of the firewood of hell and will be placed at the bottom of the fire. But if you want to compete, which is look, lawful and legal, as a legitimate, legal, uh, transparent, honest, and benefiting, these are the five, the pentagonal hierarchical structure of honest leadership, uh, of honest competition. Our competition should be based on complementing with other organizations to what? To build societies. Number two, respecting the dignity, privacy, privacy, and protection of the poor people, resources, not overspend on our salaries or our travel or whatever you call it. Number three, trying to fulfill the dreams and the hopes of the weak and vulnerable collectively. Number four, trying to build the capacity and empower the disenfranchised communities. Number five, building bridges and partnership with other organizations. If we want to compete, we'll compete on this kind of relationship with other organizations. Also together, together with other organizations, we should be framing the policies, procedures, governance, and the accountability of humanitarian and social organizations. And sector. We should together stand up to protect the sector, to protect the poor, to protect the needy, to protect the resources. This is the honest competition and the foundation of the honest competition. Uh, issue number two is a traditional, haphazardly spontaneous response of the organization because lack of professionalism. To be very honest, I'm living in Europe for the last uh, more than 40 years. But I'm still telling you and myself that a lot of Muslim-run or Muslim-led organization or Arab-led organization is still having the mentality of this kind of lack of professionalism. I'm not talking about all of them, a good, a good chunk of them. Okay? Why? Because we do what we are is familiar with us. Yeah, and we get used to do the same thing every year. We do it. Come extremely traditional. We measure the growth of our organization with the as a financial growth. 
We rely on people we trust and we know, on friends and relatives, but we don't know, we don't rely on the professional people who can do the work. We sideline or ignore the role could be played by women and young, young men. One of my colleagues was telling me in the social uh, domain, uh, we thank God, there's one or two organizations have uh, two young lady are the secretary general of such organization in, in England, Muslim ones. Okay. But most of the charitable organization in UK don't even, some of them, I'm not saying all of them, some of them even don't have board members, even have director, needless to say, the CEO or the president. Needless to say, the number of young people actually in the organization. And this happening where? I'm not talking about the Middle East or Pakistan or India, because Pakistan and India could be more advanced than us. But here, we have this culture, unfortunately. Not involving people of other faiths and cultures. We become faith-centric. If we are humanitarian and social, we should be dealing with everyone. Humanitarian, everyone. Different faith or culture. Okay? Relying only on emotional religious discourse. When it happens, we use the most inflammable statement in the holy books. Only giving attention to our central issue. I tell you something. I was attending a meeting organized by you on Ocha today about what? You know about what? Do you know a place called Mozambique in southeast, southeast or southwest? Southeast Af Africa. You know it? 700, more than 750,000 internally displaced people because of terrorist groups and because of famine and, 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 and. Do you know in South Sudan, there's at least 1 million displaced people inside because of the conflict, armed conflicts. And 2 million people could be at the, at the, at the edge of famine. We don't know them because they are not like us. They don't have the same color, the same culture, the same religion. We became centric to our uh, issue, central issue, and our religious discourse is just focused on our own people. And this is wrong. This is wrong. Because you are talking and you are dealing in a humanitarian sphere, on social sphere. Adding to this weakness of local social work, Okay, uh, impact of local and regional political systems and shrinking of civil uh, uh, or absence of civil liberty spaces, uh, the non existence of independent coordinating organization regulating and monitoring the social and humanitarian services sector, uh, global impact of Islamophobia and war and terror. All this will lead to what I said before the traditionality haphazardly spontaneous action. Uh, not observing the succession planning, board members like myself, uh, chair, chair, chair board, uh, chair, uh, chairman of board like myself, stay there for 10, 20, and 30 years, and people say, please keep waiting. Uh, weakness, uh, 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 some of these countries, not actually in the West, do not allow the local organization to have international work outside. It's not in the mandate of the government. Not anymore. Not, not at all. Weakness of the voluntary sector in these countries, particularly when we go to the East. Either because of widespread government corruption, the government extremely some governments, I'm not taking all, I'll talk about all of them, some governments, let me to be very nice to everybody. Some governments are extremely corrupt. Uh, ignorance, illiteracy, and lack of public awareness. Lack of investment in social services. 
all this, uh, the, the rise of unemployment, the over expenditure, the, the, the over expenditure on military and security, all these sort of things will let the voluntary sector to be extremely weak. How can I volunteer? And I am unemployed. I need to feed my family. That's, but this happening what? Because of two things. Either because of the, the, the corruption, the high level corruption in the country, by the government especially, or the overspending of the government on military and security and, uh, services. All these reasons, as well as others, will create the philosophy of what? Of tradition is the solution. That's why I'll go back to the title of the second issue, traditional, haphazardly, spontaneous response of the organization and lack of professionalism. This happens because of all these reasons. People don't want to try anything new. Don't want to take the risk, okay? Third the issue, the status of intellectual stagnation. Things become stagnant, stagnant, stagnant. You know, there's a flowing river, there are lakes, and there are swamps. We become like living inside swamps, stagnant, intellectual stagnation, affecting us. And such organizations are not realizing that the world is moving. We're still living in the 15, 16, 18, 19 centuries, and the, the, the neighboring countries are in the 21st or 22nd centuries. Why this state of stagnation? For the following reasons. I keep talking about this again and again and again because this is the cornerstone of all the problems that totalitarian military and security regimes who are continuously in control of social life of people. We respect the military, we respect security, but they have their function. They come to do it. Somebody prevent crime and somebody protects the country, but not socially to government to govern the country. This is number one. Number two is the presence of such regimes, which is the totalitarian regime, will eventually lead to pausing or disabling the principles of diligence, innovative creativity as an ultimate result to the widespread of fear. I'll say it again. The presence of such regimes will eventually lead to pausing or disabling the principles of diligence and the innovative creativity as an ultimate result to the widespread of fear and mistrust among citizens. I give the example in certain countries, without mentioning the names in the East, anybody can, in, 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 in a plain uniform can stop any girl or any man and take his or her mobile and look at it, and if they found something mentioned politically, they take them in a place which nobody knows. Nobody knows. And this, this is the outcome of the totalitarian regimes or military and security. This is number one. Number two, religious leaders who are manipulating their religious discourse. They keep, certain religious leaders keep narrowing the scope of the humanitarian social field. Number three, some of these suspicious characters who camouflage their dubious activities by organizing or by registering or by making other charitable activities. They could be their original work in drugs, in prostitution, in illegal, any illegal trade, ex uh, out of date medicine, out of date food, all this. And they have this kind of bad relationship with government officers. To camouflage it, they keep giving donations or having organization 
to give donation to different people. Uh, uh, government tripling laws. Such totalitarian government or regime will always, always uh, tightening the laws to prevent social cohesion between people and social movement to grow. Appointing and employing government official by force. I know that in certain countries, you find that Mr. X is the chair of the board of management or board of directors or the chief executive of board member. On what basis? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. Nobody, he, is, he or she is ex-military or ex-security. Okay? Uh, the inability of young people to create even initiatives. Yeah, and I was discussing with young man in certain country, telling him, why didn't you make initiatives? Yeah, I said, well, even you can't make initiatives. You have to take permission from the ministry. And when you go to the ministry, you have to fill a lot of forms, a lot of paperwork. Many people ask you many questions. I didn't know who are those many people. Are they... Lawyers, civilians, or military in your plain uniform or security in military uniform. So the young people are scared able to organize a football competition, to visit uh, the sick people in hospital, to clean up the road, to help anybody. Any, 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 any simple thing. So they stop the young people from taking initiatives. Uh, point to add it is the weakness of regulatory authority. This will create stagnation and the inability to monitor. Yani they have the law, they have everything, but they cannot monitor. They do not train. The ministry cannot train, cannot monitor, cannot guide, cannot build the capacity because most of the budget is spent on military and actually and uh, security. Point, I think number nine or 10, government is afraid of any communication between local organization and the international organization. And if there's something like this, they will roast you. Government does not encourage communication even between local organizations. Government does not encourage research because there's no fund for research, the ministry does not have fund for training. How about research? Sometimes you, you saw people have been honored by this, this totalitarian governments are those individuals which I mentioned about them, the corrupt individuals who are stealing the innovative ideas of the young people in the same country. emptying the content of humanitarian social work or action from the essence of its message of empowerment, the citizens of the, of the most neglected people, and to make it just something cosmetic, like hand out of food. And that's it. Weakening or even accusing the human rights organization, mainly human rights organization. You know why? Because the human rights organization is unveiling Unfortunately, the truth behind corruption. And they call them, they are driven by foreign agenda, funded by dubious foreign organization, acting as for the interest of enemy states, not loyal to the country, and all these sorts of things. For all these reasons, which I think I can how many? One, two, three, four. Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, or thirteen reasons will have intellectual stagnation. Definitely, and more. These reasons and others are more than sufficient to bury the principles of, listen to this, 
volunteering and voluntary services, diligence and industriousness, creativity, renewal, development, progressive social reform, succession planning for new community leadership, and the resurrection of souls, the souls, the souls inside our hearts. How can I be motivated to revive and empower, to be empowered and to be revitalized if I have all these 13 hurdles in front of me? Issue number four, weak organization structure, it's about three, three points, manipulation of people inside the organization, okay, synchronicity between, between uh, the structure and the values and the message. Let us talk about what do you mean by structure. A, is the structure, is the organogram of the organization or the governing board who are legally responsible for the organization or the aims, objective, message, vision, mission, values, culture, and identity or policy procedures by laws, principles, manners, and, and, or the program, the projects, the partnership, the coalition, the geographical location, the external relationship, the research, development, advocacy, all these kind of programs. Is this the structure? Structure is all this and more. Structure is all this and more. This is number one. Our number A, 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 what is the structure? All this and more. Who's in control of the organization? Okay. What do you mean by this and who are those people? We mean it's, it's bad culture, bad working atmosphere, bad working cultural behavior, and the climate inside this organization. Okay, why? Because of the following. They're not interested in designing or planning, training program, capacity building, and to the staff. They're not interested in proper job, this following proper job description, or even job description of the different department. They're not interested. Or they don't have it. They have forever jobs. And they employ people without an end. An end, and a uh, forever job. No proper contractual agreement. Unhealthy employment culture where employment procedures should, was based on whom we know, not who is capable, as I mentioned before. Some of the senior executives or board members have no experience. They're just friends and colleagues or neighbors. These are the people who manipulate the organization. Uh, rise of grouping inside this organization. What do you mean by grouping? Grouping could be culture wise sectarian-wise, faith-wise, racial-wise, uh, gender-wise, and geographical, and all this. And, uh, uh, the Egyptian group here, uh, the Pakistani group here, the Indian group here, the female are here, the, the Muslims are here, the non-Muslims are All this because of what? Because of the inability of the senior executives or the board members of creating this kind of proper training program to empower the people inside the, 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 the staff, as well as uh, not allowing them to grow inside the organization. And the, that's the, the bottom one, which is the rise of intellectual, racial, sectarian, or even geographical classification, as I mentioned earlier on. 
those people when they are in the organization will spread this bad culture inside the organization. How about the individuals? Because you said people, some of the con control and manipulation of the organization, especially when dealing with funding. Yes, people. Who are those people? Those people are forever founder, like myself, chairman, I like myself, CEO, directors, to keep them forever and untouchable. You know why? Because they protect and they are the saviors of the organization. Without them, the organization values, culture, morality, procession, aims, objectives. Oh, will be lost and will be falling in the hand of the wrong people. They have to stay there. They are the guardian. They are sent, they are sent from heaven. The forever culture is becoming a methodological meth message. The forever culture, the forever culture is becoming a methodological message hidden behind such culture, weak souls of incapable individuals, even if they have good intention. So to say that some of these historical characters are still in control of fundraising, since they are the only ones who have an access to the big donors. Not only that, so to say either, I sorry, not either, uh, stuff. I was just mixing English and Arabic. Sorry, sorry to say all, or, or, or also that the, some of the decision of the organization is taken outside the organization, not in the boardroom, not in the executive room, but by some third party which is sometimes happening. The third point, which is the synchronization. If we have in our organization, A, which is a structure, and the problem with the structure, B, with the problem with the, those individuals that are there, eventually, eventually, the outcome of all this will be this synchronization between the organization structure, aims and objectives. If we have those people inside the organization who are actually categorized in group A and B, definitely we will not have harmony between the structure and the strategy and the aims and the objective and the message and the mission. Point number five or issue number five, which is the widespread culture of materialistic charitable work. And everything is counted by money. Unfortunately, this is becoming normal. Particularly, particularly in armed conflict zones, like Syria, like Yemen, like South Sudan, and all this. Why? Let me tell you why we become heavily, we become actually money-centric or fund-centric, not, not, not need-centric. Because of the rising number of internally displaced uh, people and the refugees, because the lack of properly trained and the experienced staff, the lack of experience of the newly registered humanitarian organization working in this area. And I knew from my experience with the Syrian organization registered in Turkey, there are more than 1,000. Okay. Uh, the haphazardly unplanned reaction from the traditional and donors and experienced donors. And donors just would like to throw money. The rise of dependence syndrome on those emotionally excited traditional donors. Uh, most of these organizations in the conflict zones find it very easy to market humanitarian response program or projects. Uh, the inability of the newly registered uh, local organization and traditional uh, emotional donors to understand what the voluntary sector. This is very, very serious because you don't know. It's just they consider 
the voluntary sector is just hand out, hand out, hand out. The last, which is the most serious, the, dis the dissatisfaction of such donors or the reluctance of such donors of spending their money on what? On this group of work inside the organization in this highly volatile area. As administration cost, they keep questioning you. Some of them tell you no admin cost. No spending on training and capacity building program for the staff. No spending on research and development. This is conditionality of the funding. Organizing workshops and conferences to serve the sector. You don't understand voluntary sector. Advocacy campaign to raise public awareness to prevent massacres. Measuring impacts. Yani they spend millions of money, but they don't know the impact of such millions of money on the development of such societies. Building organization endowment schemes. We should, whenever we register a new organization, on, the, on day zero, should organize also endowment scheme or a, or a parallel organization for waqf. They don't understand bridge building, partnership building, coalition building with local. So they don't spend money on this. Only food, only clothes, only tents. That's it. Nothing else. But let me highlight more of this issue before moving to the discussion on my message to the young people. Before we move together to discuss my message to the young people, let us visit again the issue of widespread materialistic, materialistic charitable work among this organization. What do, I, what do I mean by this? It's clear for all of us that we, that the management of this organization is only interested in fundraising and fund development and instead of developing integral comprehensive vision to develop the organization strategy to develop the organization we found in some of these organizations they spend more than 50 percent on the fundraising department i visited one of them without mentioning the names or the country or the city. And they have, I think, 40 or 50 or more people working, uh, maybe 60, in media and fundraising and, and, and. And why program? You uh, raise your hand, or you raise your eyebrows, and others. More than 50, yeah, I'm not, yeah, I the organization might have 70 or 80 people. 50 of them or 60 of them are in this fundraising and fund development department. And they spend most of the fund on fundraising campaign, promotional media campaign, sponsoring community icons and superstars, hiring many employees in fund development, media, communication assets. This is very serious. It becomes a new culture. On the contrary, or on the other hand, we we'll find that the other 50% is spent on this 11 or more departments, like program and society development, accounting and finance, human resource development, internal auditing. Even some of these organizations don't have internal auditing and the quality assurance. Evaluation and measuring, some of them don't have it. Research and development, some of them don't have it. They don't believe in it. Advocacy and support, don't have it. Training, capacity building, organizing conference, and not, don't have it. Some. Building bridges, partnership, don't have it. Archiving and documentation, writing the history, don't have it. Community empowerment, don't have it. So you see, it's very clear objective. I want money. Fine, I need money, but I need to develop the community, develop the staff, and to build 
the, the, the sector. But I will not spend money on this eight at least of this 11. My message to the young people after all this discussion and the headache that I give you, I spoke about five issues, the weakness of organizational structure, traditionalism and the emotional response, intellectual stagnation, the widespread of materialistic charitable culture amongst organizations, that there is honest competition between organizations. Dear young people, if you decide to draw a pyramid to describe this situation, I mentioned a pyramid of the five steps, which I, uh, let me talk about them again. The uh, organization structure, traditionalism, intellectual stagnation, widespread of materialistic charitable culture and among the organization, and the last and not least, dishonest competition uh, between organization. If we make this pyramid is made out of five steps, we definitely, we definitely, the foundation or the base will be the weak organization structure. And the top, unfortunately, will be the dishonest competition between organizations. If we have this weak organization structure, we definitely, the final outcome is dishonest competition between organizations. Young, free, and aware people you have to realize that what you want to work in public domain all right let me talk take you and talk you with you about the public domain public domain is as an old as humanity its roots are rooted for thousands and thousands of years since the creator created this vast sprawling universe, resetting it is, it is resetting it proportionately to suit the ability of whom? Of the human who are going to live on it as a deputy of the creator. It's not something newly developed. The public demand is not developed by the West or the East or the North or the South. Even animal, birds, insects having their own public domain. Okay, so when you talk about public domain, don't ever come and tell me the theory is coming from X in in, in London or in or, or in Washington. No, public domain is something as old as humanity. Or Cairo or Andalusia. No, it's before that. Public domain were all creations of Allah, God started weaving the threads of its cognitive societies collectively collectively what to welcome the leader of this cosmic community the human so who was preparing this public domain for you is other creation of god public domain you are going to work with this public domain this is a public domain public domain Having skies, suns, moons, stars, lands, rivers, seas, ocean, mountains. I mentioned ocean twice and seas twice. There's something wrong yet. Forests, habitats, branches, flowers, fruits, and trees that bear fruits at all times by the permission of the Lord. It's public domain. So you have to realize who is beside you, behind you, in front of you, above you, underneath you in the public domain. Public domain were all creation of Allah, God. Live harmoniously with one another inside their societies and are harmoniously living with other societies. According to what? According to the magnificent cosmic law put by the most gracious, most merciful of his slaves, the all knowing who knows the treasury of the eyes and what the hearts conceal. This is a public domain. Societies are living before man, before human being, harmoniously together, then harmoniously together with other societies. Public domain where human, learned, 
from other creation. The black bird story. From a human learned from the black bird, the parrot, how to bury the dead body of their brothers or community members. This was mentioned in the story of Cain and Abel. You remember it. When uh, after killing his brother, Abel, when Cain killed Abel, he failed to bury the dead body of his brother. Allah sent the black bird to teach him. So the bird taught human being. Human being is absolutely arrogant, utterly arrogant. This public domain know the value of the black bird. Public domain were all the lives of the living creatures of God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, were organized according to the great law of life that is governing the eternal life inside this sprawling universe till the creator inherits creation and the universe again. This public domain. You have to understand what do you mean by public domain. Social work and the material work is a part of public domain. This is the public domain we talk about. That we are talking about young people. Domain where other societies were ahead of us. Were their creations citizens magnificent and innovative characteristic were the citizens were their creation with the innovative characteristics enabled them to protect the existence of the societies for thousands and thousands of years before man was created. Such societies as, in this public domain, their citizen of such society maintain their societies and protect their society to live for thousands of years for the creation of man. Such societies as, the society of Cain's black bird, the society of Solomon, and and who prepared the society of the cave's men dog, the dog in the cave's men chapter, the society of Eunice and the whale, the whale, the dog, the ant. The whale, the dog, the ant, the hoopoe bird, the black bird, the search of the flocks, of the ababil, the birds, who killed the army of Abraham, of Abramos, the societies of the organized bees kingdom, cow, spider, mentioned in the Quran, all these societies were there before man working together harmoniously in the public domain. Regarding the pentagonal hierarchical structure, which I mentioned before at the very beginning, slide number four, when we talk about what kind of competition we need, we need, we need it to make it transparent, legal, legitimate, Benefiting societies and uh, benefiting societies and uh, honest. That's what we call it pentagonal. It should be based on an atmosphere or climate where we found this attracting constant or dominant. If, and if, if how can I explain this? If we want to grow a tree, we have to surround such a tree with an atmosphere. All right. If we want to have this kind 
and of, 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 of good competition as an outcome, we have to create around this atmosphere before we put the structure. So one is a structure or the foundation, second in the atmosphere. What is this atmosphere? The idea made out of idea, philosophy, belief, culture, manner, history, people's habits, and customs. With this atmospheric climate, with this atmospheric constants, we can define the territorial boundaries where we will be able to lay down the foundation of the organization structure that will build that will build over it the management structure guiding the building process of this system. The steadiness, strength, cohesion of foundation of an institutional building is inversely proportional to the quartet of these bad fruits. What are the bad fruits? Traditional spontaneous response, intellectual stagnation, widespread of materialistic charitable and social work, which will eventually lead to dishonest competition. The integration or complementarity between the atmosphere and the foundation will definitely lead to the creation of compatibility between both of them. The atmosphere has to be compatible to the structure. Please let us look at so the integration of complementarity between the atmosphere and the foundation will definitely lead to the creation of the compatibility between both of them to bear the good fruits needed by societies. Please let us look at these societies as we look at the family construction. Let us consider our family as a society, our organization as a society, our state as a society, our nation as a society. And the construction of these societies is based on the same principles governing the relationship between atmosphere and foundation. Atmosphere and foundation. How to lay down the foundation to this social structure? This is the final and the most difficult one. The creation of social climate change is not an easy task, as you young people imagine. It is an interlocking system with other societal system based on the following. Constants, the following constants. I have how many constants here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven constants. Number one, family cohesion and the role of family in building in the building process of the national affiliation and community cohesion. Extremely, the family is a cornerstone a male father and female mother who are married lawfully and legally. The role, the value of education after the family is education and the, the, the respect of science and scientists, of teachers. Such education is not only the state education, the traditional one, no. It could be other kind of education, like applicable education, cognitive education, interactive education, and others, different kinds of observation. The presence of suitable civil liberty space, definitely young, 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 young men and women. You have to have a decent or reasonable civil liberty space to nurture and allow innovation Without civil, civil liberty space, there is no innovation, no pioneering, no experimentation, no renewal. Nothing will happen. If you are walking in the street, or you're on a bus, or you're on a plane, 
or any or a cinema or a football, uh, watching football match in a stadium, and somebody take your uh, telephone from you to see what you are uh, communicating about, or you are raising the flag of certain country or certain issue and they put you in, in jail, there's no innovation. So family, cohesion, number one. Number two, education. Number three, the presence of suitable civil liberty space to nurture and allow innovation, pioneering, experimentation, renewal, expression, and expression and systemization, critical thinking and refutation, analysis and auditing, blogging and recording, the freedom of affiliation. I'm free to become what I want to be. I'm free to become loyal to what I want to be like the freedom of affiliation and loyalty and the participating, participating freely in more open public domain without being threatened by the totalitarian repressive regimes. This is number three, constant. The fourth constant is the presence of a minimum level of awareness. You have to raise the standard of awareness in the public, public awareness. Number five is the correction of history. Who is writing the history? Who is writing the history? Look at a lot of countries over the last hundred years. Who is writing the history? Either the military or the security or the one man show or the hypocrite for actually being employed by these totalitarian regimes. The independence of this institution as well. Judici judicial, legislative, professional syndicates, parliamentary, media, drama, military, security, education, culture, civil society sector, press, literature, finance, and monetary, statistics, and research, and the others. And the protecting them from what? Protecting them from what? From the inclusion and domination of the executive power of the executive power of the government over the state institution and the nation and the citizen. And this only happened inside a totalitarian regime or regime controlled by military and security. All these historical constants young people are essential principles needed and leading to building strong institutional structures that will prevent the traditional spontaneous response, intellectual stagnation, the widespread of materialistic charitable work, which eventually will lead to dishonest competition between organizations. I thank you very much for being patient from my late start. And uh, God bless you all. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa